Hi, this is Misha, and this is a video that's been requested for quite some time, and now I feel like I'm at least halfway prepared to do it. This is a look at the Chinese Type 56 automatic or assault rifle, which was China's version used in the PLA of the AK and later a certain derivative of the AKM. So on the table, we start off with a Polytech AK-47S called the Legend. We also have a Chinese SKS, this is a military surplus one, confusingly also called the Type 56, but instead of assault rifle. These are called the Type 56 carbine. And finally, we have an early import B West AKS. Another semi-auto Chinese from the 80s. So we'll get into the history of the Chinese military rifle and we'll also talk about some of the uh, imports from the 1980s, the so-called Chinese pre -bands. So, to jump in, we'll hold up the legend here. In 1955, Soviet Russia and China made an agreement for China to produce both the SKS and original AK Type 3, that would be the milled, the, the, the final major version of the milled Russian AK in China. And this was after China had already started to produce other Soviet guns. For example, they produced the Mosin Nagant M44 carbine with the uh, folding spike bayonet as the Type 53. They also produced a copy of the Russian Tokarev TT-33, first as the Type 51 and then soon the Type 59, oh, excuse me, the Type 54. Just to be clear, the Type 59 was the copy of the Makarov that would soon go into production after these. So China was already producing Soviet small arms, so for them to do the SKS and the Kalashnikov was, was only logical. As with the Soviet guns, these would be chambered for the 7.62 by 39 cartridge. And the factories would get set up and production would begin in 1956 at the number 66 arsenal. I'm not going to try to produce, uh, excuse me, pronounce the Chinese names. I'll just use the numbers. Anyway, it was arsenal or factory 66. And the first guns were produced on Soviet tooling using Soviet assistants, Soviet advisors and engineers and the earliest ones were actually assembled using Soviet parts. So the earliest Type 56's are exact copies of the Russian AK Type 3 just because they were mostly made from Russian AK Type 3 parts. The same thing would happen with the SKS the same year it would also be accepted into PLA service as the Type 56 carbine and the early ones would be produced with Russian parts transitioning over to uh, Chinese as the years would go by. These are often called the Sino-Soviet SKSs. The ones from 56 are pretty much all Russian and by 58, 59 they were pretty much all Chinese. Same goes for the AKs. China being China, they very quickly mass-produced both. And they would quickly enter service in the Chinese military, and they would replace a really wide range of hodgepodge guns left over from World War II and even before. Obviously, the, the Type 53 Mosin Nagant would stay in second line in reserve use, but older Mausers of different stripes, a lot of old captured Japanese guns would be, would be retired out. And they would introduce several changes as time would go on. And we'll get to those in a second. 
after the Factory 66 would begin production, other factories would come online. For example, you had Factory 386, 386. You also had Factory 416, 416. Eventually, you would also have Factory 56 and many, many others. And those are just the ones that did final assembly. Almost countless small subcontractors, subsidiaries would also contribute to Kalashnikov production. And that's not even getting into magazines and pouches and other gear that would go with these. The original Type 56 would take a standard Type 1 bayonet with wood grips. It would have a milled receiver. The first guns would have a screw-in or thread-in barrel to the receiver. Soon after, and people kind of just kind of argue back and forth when that happened, but at some time during production, they would switch over to the pressed and pinned-in barrel. This was both cheaper and easier and faster, well, all three. It was also much easier to headspace the gun. And if you needed to replace the barrel, to put a new barrel in. So all around, a good thing. The Chinese milled receiver is almost identical to the Russian. It has the lightning cuts. It has the sling swivel mounted on the rear. You'll see the large checkered pistol grip on some. This would be used on some Type 3 Russians. They would also do a kind of a quasi-copy of the smaller, smooth Russian grip, which was more common on the Type 3. The buttstock is very similar. It has the, the comb with the two tangs, one on top, one on bottom. But, and it is still swept down, but the comb is adapted a little bit differently to Russian. The shape's just ever so slightly different. It does still store a cleaning kit and the butt trap there. But even the cleaning kit, get it out here, is just a smidge. They did their own thing a little bit. Hang on a sec. Here's the kit. The body itself is very similar to Russian, but the top actually goes inside versus outside. And it only has one uh, nipple in there to, uh, to lock on instead of the two that's on the uh, standard Soviet cleaning kit. This one's a little loose. Often these are because again, they're only locking on one side. So the cleaning kit was similar, but a little different. These would have a blued finish. The early guns would have the polished bolt carrier common to the Soviets. Hand guards are very similar. You'll notice the upper hand guard here does not have the vent cutouts like the lower. This was a later simplification that Chai introduced. Cleaning rod. Early guns would have a simple muzzle nut. The earliest would have an open front sight ported gas tube. The original Chinese mags were virtual copies of late production Soviet AK Type 3 mags. They would have the ribbing and the spine in the back. This is just a generic mag. I think it's actually Polish, but I pulled it out just to show you that they did do that. And the sling. We have a canvas sling that's very similar to Russian. It's just a little thinner. But instead of having the metal, the riveted on metal plate with um, a, a clip, or the early Russians would use a leather keeper, we have a smaller D-ring with just a simple leather strap to hold it on. And I actually prefer these because they are lighter and they don't scuff up your gun as much. And they're much easier to get on and off the gun. So a uh, good call there, China. I think their sling is uh, much better. While we've got it on the table, let's talk about the Chinese SKS, the Type 56 carbine. It's pretty much just like a Soviet. The earliest Chinese guns were exact copies of the Soviet, as I said. They would have a blade bayonet. But as time would go on, they would uh, make many, many changes. Where the SKS went out of production in the mid to late 50s in Russia, people debate between 56 and 58, but it's really neither here nor there, China was only starting up. In the 60s, they would introduce several changes. First, they would move the sling swivel from the bottom to the side of the stock early on, and then they would move it back to the bottom 
in the mid-60s. The biggest change would be the switch from a blade bayonet to a spiker. Here. And this would appear around 1965. China liked the spike bayonet better. They felt they had better penetration against clothing and just liked it better. Soon thereafter, they would start to introduce more and more stamped metal parts. This gun uh, is, I believe, from 67. So it has a couple of the stamped parts. For example, the trigger guard is a simplified style. They also deleted the lightning cut on the bolt carrier. Later, they would also delete the lightning cut here on the rear sight and on the front sight. In bayonet housing, they would delete the lightning cuts. They would make stocks from wood. They would also start to introduce a Bakelite type upper handguard. It's actually more of a reinforced fiberglass, but we'll call it Bakelite. Everyone else does. They would even produce some guns with a full Bakelite stock. These are often called jungle stocks because they wouldn't uh, rot or mildew in human environments. Speaking of that, this has the kind of the jungle type sling instead of having leather tabs here and here we have these kind of metal curly cues which obviously would not rot away like leather would I think they're kind of interesting but China really took the SKS and ran with it and throughout the 60s and 70s they found more and more ways to introduce stamped metal parts they also would start to go from a screw in to a pressed and pinned in barrel in the late 60s with the same benefits as the uh, the AK. I mention this because this gun was adopted at the same time as the AK but they already were trying to replace it in 1963 by the Type 63 and we'll splash up a picture here. The Type 63 is quite interesting and none are really available in the US because they were select fire. They look a lot like an SKS but they use an AK style rotating bolt. They use 20 round AK style magazines. They have an adjustable gas block for launching grenades. And they have a selector switch. What's interesting about the Type 63, it was pretty much they wanted to replace a gun that didn't need replacing. By this point, they still had this idea that they needed an assault rifle for close in infantry fire and then a, a true carbine for a longer range more accurate fire so the idea was for the type 63 to replace the carbine but it this wasn't necessary so by the time the type 63 was actually in production around 1968 it was completely obsolete and they only produced it for about 10 years the, now they did make several million i believe around five million but it was in PLA, excuse me, PLA Chinese Army service for a very brief period of time before being surplused out. And it was really only ever meant for second line reservist use in the first place. The SKS was pulled out of service in the 60s and many, many were sold or given away to communist allies such as North Korea and Vietnam, amongst many others. So Chinese SKSs will pop up in a lot of places. Albania was a big client of uh, China. They purchased uh, a lot of Chinese AKs and SKSs and even some production capacity. But I just thought we would mention the um, Chinese SKS since we're talking about AKs because that, that kind of informs what comes next. I'll rearrange here guys. Swap these around. As I said at the beginning, this is a 1980s B-West early import from around 85. And this is a really good copy, clone, semi-auto version of a later Chinese Type 56. Now the story here is interesting. Russia adopted, introduced the AKM in 1959. Now the AKM we talk about in many videos but a brief recap, it's essentially an AK that is switched from having a milled receiver 
to one made out of 1.0 one millimeter stamped steel. This is both cheaper and faster to produce. It's also lighter. And the AKM had several other changes. For example, they went to a lighter profile barrel. They altered the sights just a smidge. They went to a ribbed top cover instead of smooth. They changed up the bolt carrier. They went to a um, slant type muzzle brake. They altered the shape and style of the furniture going from a wood grip to a Bakelite style. They added palm swells, so on and so forth. They also introduced a new type of bayonet that had a lug under the gas block as opposed to the front sight. Now the AKM was exported to a lot of Russian allies, especially pretty much the entire Warsaw Pact. East Germany, Poland, Romania, all produced exact copies. Egypt also obtained the rights. Other nations like Hungary produced variants, which were quite close, but they did their own thing. And a couple like Czechoslovakia did not adopt the AKM. Now, by 1960, relations between Russia and China had fallen apart. They were no longer close allies, and Russia was not going to share the AKM. China didn't have the rights or the data package to manufacture the AKM. They only had it for the AK. No problem. It's China. They're fantastic reverse engineers. What they did in the 1960s, they worked on replacing the Type 56's milled receiver with a stamped receiver, and this is what they came up with. This is similar to a European Russian pattern, but it is quite different in the details. First off, it's made from 1.5, some people say 1.6 millimeter steel. Take your pick. I've seen them used interchangeably. But it's used from thicker steel. And the rivet patterns are different. As the back, they're very similar. They're not quite spaced the same, but they're similar. But in the front, they're radically different, as you see here. We have three rivets, but this one's moved down. So they changed the rivet pattern. They also went to a two rivet trigger guard, or really three, there's one in the back, two in the front, versus the four or five rivet of the AKM. So they went to the cheaper to produce, and even though this is heavier steel than normal on an AKM, it's still much lighter than on a AK. They also introduced the pressed and pinned in barrel. And some would come with this uh, AKM style slant compensator. Others would have either a muzzle nut, and a lot of the Chinese guns in military service would have a bare barrel. They didn't thread them. I guess they just didn't have a use for it. So they would alter the Type 56. Now work began on the stamped receiver in the 60s. Now there's, I found a little discrepancy as to when the stamped replaced the milled, but it seems like it was between 1967 and 1970 with some factories introducing it earlier than others and some using up older parts. But in the late 60s, the transition would happen. There were also many other changes to the Type 56 during the 60s. One of the earliest was the front sight went from having an open hood to a complete, I'm going to point this at you, enclosed ring. This served two purposes. It does better protect your front sight. It also helps keep the front sight picture clearer. It's possible in the heat of the moment if you have an open-eared front sight to mistake one of the ears for your actual sight post and shoot with it. With a ring like this, that's very much not likely. That happened around 1960, maybe 59. Also, you started to see this now very famous underfolding spike bayonet. Very much like the one on the SKS, just shorter for the AK. It's fixed. There are some versions that are semi-quick detachable. And this seems to have appeared just after it did on the SKS, around 1966, maybe late 65. Again, not all factories probably introduced it at the exact same time. The rear sling swivel would be moved 
to the buttstock as on an AKM, away from the receiver. This has a few advantages. Gives you a longer sling mount point. It also clears the side of your receiver if you need to mount optics. And a different sling, same as used on the SKS, could also be used on the Type 56 with the double tab. But in other ways, the Type 56 retained AK features. For one, we still have a heavy ER profile, the AK Type 3 profile, medium heavy barrel versus the lighter AKM. We have the front sling swivel still on the gas block here, or right behind it actually. Still have a ported gas tube. We do not have palm swell handguards. The rear sight is still 800 meter equivalent, not a thousand. The top cover is the slightly heavier and still smooth. Most were still with the blued finish, where many, many AKMs would have a painted parkerized finish, although some Europeans, such as the Polish and the East Germans, would continue to use bluing for a while. They would keep the bolt carrier in the white for some time, but they would eventually go over to uh, bluing the bolt carrier as well. And we would keep using wood pistol grips. This is the kind of skinnier style that's more or less a copy of the AK, Russian AK-3. We would still use this for quite some time. And many other changes. China also hung on to the double hook trigger Although they did introduce the so-called rate reducer, which was actually an out-of-battery safety feature of the AKM. So there is that. They kind of had a hybrid trigger system, rate reducer of the AKM, but still the double hook of the AK. So that's pretty much where the Chinese Type 56 AK was at by the 70s. The idea was actually to replace it with a gun known as the Type 81. And it, it did, although the 81 was a little slower to go into service than they had hoped. The 81 was took elements from the AK, the SKS, and the SVD and threw in some of its own. There are very few, I mean single digits most likely, maybe a dozen, semi-auto 81s in the USA. So not much I can do to help you there. They go for big money. But by the 80s, the idea was to replace the Type 56 in frontline Chinese military service. That said, it was still planned to be kept in second line and um, kind of provincial reserve and police use for a time longer. In fact, some are still in use today. Heck, some SKSs, some Type 56 carbines, are still in use as ceremonial guns. The only other change I can mention is the magazines went to the now very famous flatback pattern. They lost the rib and they simplified how they were stamped. Some guns are even entirely made of stamped steel with no machined lugs. I don't think I have any of those here today. But they did adapt and simplify the magazine for themselves. They made 20 round mags for the Type 63, which were very similar. A little bit different, but very similar. They would also make extended 40 round mags. And of course, China would make drum magazines. They would make a 75 round drum, and they would make a 100 round drum. And the Chinese drum is the back loading style that's actually quite prevalent on the market right now. They were very common in the 80s, then after bands, they weren't. And now they're, they're a style that's either from Romania or Korea has come back around and um, kind of made them more common again. So yeah, the Chinese Type 56 Kalashnikov. All right, now let's get into some variants and also the uh, 1980s pre-bands. Now forewarning, I'm not gonna get all the pre-band importers and stuff because there were just so many, especially early on. However, we have the Type 56-1, which was just like the standard 56, except we have an underfolding buttstock made out of stamped steel. This is a different pattern 
to the Russian in many ways. It has the sweep down, more like an AKS Type 3 underfolder for the mill gun, but it's made of stamped steel, more like for the AKMS. That said, it doesn't have rivets running up and down, just two back here. Instead, we have heavier gauge steel, and we only lock on the left side like the original AKS. It doesn't have the double locking like an AKMS. The rear trunnion is also very different. We have two rivets very close together at the top and that's pretty much it holding this back plate in. This is because this is really just a plate. The stock itself locks directly into the receiver, the stamped receiver in this case. And I guess they figured they could get away with that because they're using the heavier 1.5 millimeter receiver versus the 1.0. On the regular AKMS, you'll have a, um, a trunnion that goes all the way forward here and the stock will lock into it. But in this, we're just locking directly into the receiver. Otherwise, the underfolders are the same. Now this here is a Polytech import and it has some Polytech features. These were named the AKS. So, the import history. The first company to import, at least officially in any numbers, was Clayco Sports out of Kansas. Now there were some guns that came in in the 60s via returning soldiers from Vietnam. Again, Vietnam had received quite a few AKs from, um, from China and several, some of these were captured by GIs. This was not legal at the time, however, there was an amnesty in November of 1968, and so if you brought back a gun and then registered it during the amnesty, it was legal. And several were, were registered this way. Others were brought back but never registered, and they're still out there in kind of a not legal state, but that's neither here nor there. The first semi-autos to come in were by Clayco and they started to appear around 1983 perhaps early 1984 no one knows for sure another early importer and some claim that they imported before Clayco was uh, GSAD Golden State Arms Distributors now there's some confusion. For one thing, this is not the Golden State Arms that operated back in the 50s and 60s. They have a different address in California, although both are Californian. Golden State Arms, completely different entity. So this has mixed up a lot of people. Golden State Arms Distributors was not founded until 1984. Clayco was founded in September of 1982. So just by the years and the numbers, no, it does not look like Golden State Arms Distributors imported Kalashnikovs before Clayco. Maybe they were very close, but it looks like Clayco probably beat them to the punch by as much as a year. But either way, they were both early importers, and they would bring in guns that were made with the fixed stock of Bakelite, either red Bakelite or sometimes black with kind of a greenish shoe. They were marked AKS and they would usually take a Type 2 and AKM bayonet. They were the most modern Chinese guns in production at the time. They weren't really classic Type 56s. They did not sell well because the AK was still new to the market, 76239 was only starting to become available, and they didn't have that classic AK look. Also, they would have, early on, a lot of warnings about not converting to a full auto stamped on the dust cover, just a lot of markings. Other markings would vary. Uh, they wouldn't always have the factory markings early on, you know, the factory number. The import mark could be either be on the receiver, on the side, on the underside in front of the magwell, or some were even on the barrel. After Clayco, many, many, many other companies jumped in. You saw in the first half there my early import B West. Surprisingly, B West was one of the early importers. They seemed to have begun around 1984, maybe early 85. And they would import a wide range of guns as well. 
uh, a lot of spikers though. You'll see other companies joining in soon. You'll have uh, China Sports, CSI. You will have IA Corporation, IACO, pop in. You will have Sherwood. You'll have Ray, RAI. You'll have Sile out of New York. You'll have BSC down in Texas. And the list just keeps going on. Probably the most famous was the people who brought this in beginning around 1985, 1986 in that time frame. Polytech guns would start to come over through KFS, King's Firearms. These guns have a very good reputation today and the idea behind the KFS imports was to produce a higher grade weapon. For example, the Polytech guns from over in China would have muzzle nuts. They would either have a spike bayonet fixed to it like this one, or they would have a type 1 bayonet lug under the front sight base. They would do extended, not a huge amount, but a little bit extended and curved mag catches, better ergonomics. They would use a very nice double hook trigger that was kind of polished up a wee bit. They would extend the shelf on the safety here out and round it just to make it a little more pleasant and not poke people in the sharp edges. They would usually keep on doing polished bolt carriers when others would start to go to blued. And they would have a larger checkered pistol grip like the early Russian AK Type 3s. It's a lot more ergonomic for American hands. Another variation here is this. This is another Polytech import. This is still also marked AKS. This is the so-called Bakelite gun. Now this is patterned after the Type 56-2. China would begin working on the Type 56-2 in the late 60s, early 70s, and it was supposed to be an upgrade, I guess you could call it a midlife upgrade of the Type 56. It was supposed to feature both cheaper and more durable and lighter weight furniture made out of synthetic material. And it was supposed to have a side folding stock made of metal with Bakelite here. It even stores a hidden cleaning kit in here. You need a bullet tip to press in and it springs out. And it would have a couple of different styles of pistol grip. I've just got a Russian Bakelite mag in it, but uh, to match up. By the time the Type 56-2 was ready to go though, the Type 81 was coming around. Basically, the military never adopted it. However, the Chinese police did and purchased it in quite large numbers. And China exported it in select fire versions to many nations around the world. So you will see these Bakelite guns. For the US market, it turned into the early Clacos with the Bakelite furniture. And this gun here. This is a Polytech, as I said. Another version would be imported as the Type 56S 2. And it would be similar, but it would be imported by IAC, IA Corporation. And it would be slightly different. It would not have the Type 1 bayonet lug, it would have the AKM Type 2 lug here under the gas block. And instead of having the larger Polytech style grip, it would have a smaller, more rounded grip, kind of like the VZ-58, actually very, very similar to the VZ-58. So those exist as well. In addition to the 56S-2 with the side folding stock, there was a 56S-3 that came in with a fixed stock, and these could be Again, red, black, or kind of blackish green bakelite. You will see 
several versions coming in. Now the two main conglomerates, now the factories that were making these were still Factory 66, which was commonly Norinco, and Factory 386 or Factory 416, which could be Polytech or Norinco. You also see a few Factory 56s, which were commonly the 86S bullpup. But yeah, Norinco and Polytech were basically conglomerates. They weren't actual factories. They were, they were export companies over in China that sent guns over here, and then they were imported by various American companies from small to large batches, but most of them were quite large. Some other versions that came in of note were the 84S, which was in 223. And several versions came in. There was the 84S-1 with an underfolding stock. They did an 84S with a fixed spike bayonet and wood furniture. They would also do a Bakelite fixed stock version is the 84S-3. And these would often have a birdcage flash hider as opposed to a muzzle nut. And they would feed from proprietary magazines, mostly of 30 rounds, sometimes of 15 rounds. There was the 86S Bullpup, as I mentioned. It's an interesting looking critter. It had a, fo a folding vertical grip pretty much ripped off from the Steyr AUG. It had a very interesting so-called fish lips flash hider. It still had a bayonet lug too. And it was in 76239. There was a so-called RPK known as the 87S. And it could either be in 7.62, most common, or 2.23, which is quite uncommon. Now, it wasn't really an RPK in the true sense because these guns that I'm mentioning here, 84, 86, 87, they weren't Chinese military. These were guns that China made for export, either to America or other clients. But anyway, the 87S was a quasi-RPK. It had a longer barrel. All of these have had 16. It had a 20 inch barrel. It had a bipod. Interestingly, the bipod was coupled in front of the sight base. And it would normally have just a standard receiver. It wouldn't have a lot of RPK features. It did have the club foot buttstock though, made of wood. And it would usually ship with at least one 75 round drum and a couple of 30 round magazines. Not a whole lot of those came in. There was also the very, very brief Type 88S. And this is interesting. The Type 88S or the 88S semi-auto was in 5.45 by 39, the AK-74 round. It was the first 5.45 gun to come into the United States for the civilian public. They only imported 50, some people say 100, but a very small number nonetheless. And that was it, because these came in right before the 89 ban. The 88 is interesting because China never adopted 545. However, in the late 80s, North Korea did. So I have a educated guess theory that perhaps China was working with North Korea on their 545 weapon, which they even call the Type 88. And that's why China was producing 5.45 caliber barrels, because they would not have been producing it for themselves. And there are very few other clients in the world that would have wanted that caliber in the late 80s. 5.56 was becoming predominant, or people wanted to stick with 7.62.39. Either way, it's a very rare variant, and it is simply a reverse engineered AK-74. And it does still carry over some original AK features because it's made in China. We also have the Polytech National Match, which was a version of the Legend in a way. It was still labeled as an AK-47S. It had a milled receiver, but it had the longer 20-inch barrel, and it was supposed to be a little more accurate. Again, they just they made these some. You could even find some, for example, 84Ss with the underfolding spike bayonet. They were even going to import a Bakelite folder with a spike, although they never got around to it, but because of the ban. So they just brought over pretty much whatever they thought America might want and would buy. For example, there was the Polytech so-called Galil folder, which had a copy of the Galil folding stock, 
again, never used by the Chinese military, but was made for America because it was a little more traditional looking and it was made longer to better suit the longer length of pull that most Americans prefer. So that was another pretty rare one to come in. You can even find a couple of early Bakelite folders that have wooden grips. These tend to be considered prototypes or just early imports. The early, early imports are very interesting from 83 to 85 because they don't have a lot of markings. They don't, they don't really have a lot of that. They're very close to military. As time went on and as the gun became more and more successful and importers wanted more and more, they got a little more commercialized. They started to make guns not military configuration but just more for the American market. And you can kind of tell this. The, the quality is um, kind of, I'm not going to say goes down, but um, yeah, you can just see the more rushed machining. Now we're not going to get into the, the post band that the guns brought in from 90 to 94 in this video. That's, just, that's for another day, guys. This is already long enough. I will say in final thoughts, I like these Chinese guns. They, especially the ones set up in military configuration, are very interesting to me. And they are true factory built guns, no 922R goofiness. On the other hand, I will say I don't think they're perfect and I don't think they're the best guns. This blued finish is very attractive, very commercial grade, but I've noticed it rusts or at least starts to form some freckling much easier than a true military grade finish you might find on say an SA-85M or original parts kit gun or even some of the Zastava guns. It just seems like the finish was built to be more pretty than it was to be more durable or rust resistant. Likewise, the furniture, now this is the Bakelite's not the best example. Let me pull this one back over here. The furniture, now China always used hardwood. They did not do laminate, at least as far as I'm aware. It seems like the furniture they put on a lot of the import guns was prettier, was lighter colored, prettier than the stuff you'll find on the military kits and guns. I kind of wish they'd stuck with the military furniture. I like that utilitarian look, but they definitely tried to pretty up the furniture some, again, like using this larger pistol grip too. And if you look on the outside, you really see very nice machining, but sometimes if you open the inside of a Chinese gun, especially when it hasn't been fired much and is very new, there's some pretty rough machining, guys. This is most notable if you look at your bolt, like the bottom where the feed lug is, to in compare it to say a Russian bolt or a Bulgarian, there's more visible tool marks. I can even feel them. And the same goes for a lot of the inside or even the lightning cuts of my Polytech Legend. Feeling those lightning cuts and then feeling the lightning cuts in say a Bulgarian SA-93, the Bulgarian lightning cuts are much more smooth and even. Now, I'm not saying this makes the, the Chinese guns bad. I'm just saying that they were mass produced in China for the American market. And then for their day, they were, they were the cheap AKs. They were much cheaper than the Hungarian or Steyr or Valmets. You could get the stamped guns for as low as uh, 300. And you could get the, uh, the mill guns for just a bit over 500. And this was at a time when many of the other AKs were, were much more than that. AKs actually were pretty expensive in the 80s for the most part, they didn't start to get cheap until they became very popular in the late 80s, 90s, and of course we have all kinds of bands and things. But I just want to be realistic about the Chinese guns. These were built over in China to be shooters, and they're really good at shooters. I would shoot all of mine. I don't have a problem doing that. It's just because of this blued finish, I'm very careful to, to oil them because they will tend to rust a little faster, a little more so than um, than other pre-band Kalashnikovs like a Valmet. But on the other hand, they still have cold hammer forge chrome line barrels. We have properly heat treated receivers. We have spring loaded firing pins in the Polytex, which is nice. The double hook triggers are outstanding. All nicely done rivets. They take standard mags with just a minimum of play. I mean, you want some play in an AK mag. They shouldn't be rock tight but not excessive because the magwells were never cut out. And import marks can really vary. Like I said, they can be very small to very large. So that's just kind of depending on who brought them in.
that way we just talk about them here briefly. Like I said, I know there's more. As I said, in this one I have the Bakelite mag. China did produce a copy of a Bakelite mag. It's not made out of the same fiberglass material. It's more of a modern polymer. And from everything I've read, the Chinese Bakelite colored mags are just for the American market. They did not really produce them for, for military customers. It was just, you know, to, to be Bakelite. Also on the table, I brought out my Chinese chest rig. This is a very common, and it's in our mag pouch video, so I'm not going to go on to it here, but it holds three mags and has four smaller pockets for storing gear. So these are pretty common to be sold around with these guns back in the 80s. I think they're neat. China also made a five cell belt pouch, and they made a smaller pouch to hold the 20 round mags of the Type uh, 63. Well guys, I hope this was a decent overview of the pre-banned Chinese. I do believe that Clayco was the original importer, but just because of the dates and how everything worked out. Either way, it doesn't matter. Early guns. It's really happy to be able to show you this Type 56 S2 type gun. I think they're pretty interesting. Very neat folding mechanism. Very And you'll find both the muzzle nut and the slant brake on these. Typically, Norinco guns will have the slant brake and Polytex will have the nut. Now, early on, before this really became standardized, it could be either way. My B West did come with the slant brake, but I've seen early Polytex not come with it. So, If you have any questions or want to share pictures and stories about your own Chinese guns, that'd be great. We do have some shooting videos on a couple of these, so check those out if you want more range footage and that kind of thing. Really appreciate you tuning in. If you like the video, please click. If you haven't already subscribed and could, we'd really appreciate that. And please click that too. As always, this is Misha. And please tune in again next time for more hopefully unique and interesting videos. We'll catch you then.